Rupert, I'm going to turn to you. And if you wouldn't mind, just a little um, uh, bit of your origin story as well. And the, the, feel free to ignore me. But the, the thing that always sticks in my mind was the comment I think you made to your mother as a boy that uh, you believed we were a dream in God's infinite mind. And here we are, however many years later, I wouldn't want to speculate. And you now are pretty sure of that fact. <laughs> Yes, um, it, indeed. Let's start there because, it, in fact, it's exactly where Bob finished off by saying that uh, his model suggests basically that consciousness is fundamental. I express this apparently. My mother um, takes every opportunity to remind me as a seven year old boy by, as you rightly said, saying to her that I think that. Um, the whole world is a dream in God's mind. And I apparently then went on to say that I felt that our our role in the dream was to make the dream as beautiful a dream as possible. So this was a, um, a, a childish intuition that was expressed in the, in, 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 the, in the Christian language in which I was brought up. And I then... Uh, forgot this intuition and just carried on a, 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 a regular um, upbringing, um, school, or, or, or the, all the regular experiences that young boys go through. I, I have to say, um, my my uh, childhood and teenage years were, were considerably less extraordinary than yours, Tom. I have no out-of-body experiences <laughs> to, to, to relate. And as I say, I forgot this early intuition and just became I I immersed in, 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 a, in a, a very ordinary, typical, regular upbringing uh, um, uh, as a boy and, and a teenager. In fact, my father used to, to uh, remind me uh, um, regularly that apparently my housemaster from um, boarding school, where I, where I was, in fact, I spent all my education in boarding school, age 13, he wrote to him, to my father once and said, when is Rupert going to start being interested in something apart from football and pop music? So, <laughs> <laughs> so it took a couple more years for my housemaster's wish to come true, aged uh, 15, uh, 15, 16, two, uh, 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 let me just back up a little bit, really from the age of probably 10, 11, 12 onwards, I was interested in science, um, particularly uh, biochemistry. I wanted to go into um, something, uh, either medical research or biochemistry, but I was definitely on track for a, a scientific um career. When I was 15 or 16, two things happened, which changed the course of my life. The first was I was introduced to the poetry of Rumi. Uh, now, of course, Rumi is well known by, by millions of, of people. And we're accustomed to the beautiful translations of, of or, or perhaps I should say renderings of Coleman Barks and, and, and others who have really translated his poetry in, into contemporary language. In those days, they, they were, the translations were, were, were much drier uh, and more erudite. Arbery and Nicholson uh, made translations of the Mathnavi and Rumi's poetry. So th these were the, the translations I had and loved them very much. And uh, Rumi's poetry, I, I think, reawakened in me this early intuition that I had had as a young child that that, that what we know of as, as, as the universe is uh, God's uh, or a, a dream in God's infinite mind, and that we are characters in that dream. So, and then the other experience that happened to me, I aged, uh, I think, 15, I went to uh, an exhibition of uh, a man called Michael Cardew, who was one of the founding fathers of the uh, British studio pottery movement. And walking into his exhibition at the Camden Art Centre, I can still, I can close my eyes and I can, I can enter that room, that exhibition space again for the first time. And I was, I was just, I, I, I was literally, I, I was blown away by, by what I saw. I had never seen um, objects 
like this that had such um, visceral, evocative power. And um, I really decided there and then that that's what I was going to do in life. I wanted, I came away with this, just a simple desire. I, I'm going to learn, I want to learn to make things like this. So uh, at this point in my life, my um, interest in science came to a fairly abrupt end. I left school, I went to art school, I ended up uh, actually spending the last two years of Michael Cardew's life with him. He was 80 years old when I started my apprenticeship, apprenticeship with him, and I had the last couple of years of his life with him. And at the same time, uh, uh, early when, uh, age 16, I started to, uh, I learned to meditate. And I became very interested in the classical Advaita Vedanta tradition, which uh, I learned at a school in London called the Study Society at Collet House in London. And it was run then by a man called Dr. Francis Rolls, who I really considered to be my first teacher. And he would go every year to India and spend time with the uh, then Shankaracharya of the north of India, Shantananda Saraswati. And he would bring back the, the classical Advaita teaching. And I spent 20 years um, in this school going regularly, uh, at least twice a week. Um, I learned to I learned to meditate. I was attending regular weekly groups, studying the philosophy of non-duality. I learned the Mevlevi, Mevlevi turning in in uh, Rumi's tradition. I learned um, <clears throat> Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff's movements, and this really uh, this interest uh, was really the, uh, the, the 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 central point, the focal point of my life for the next twenty years. In the meantime, of course, I left art school. Uh, I finished my apprenticeship with Michael Cardew. I set up my first studio, so I was working as an artist in my studio uh, having exhibitions and so these were my two overriding interests in in life uh, beauty and truth my interest for beauty was satisfied in my studio and my um, interest in truth was satisfied by um, my study of the advaita tradition as i say through the classical advaita teachings but also through my study of uh, Ramana Maharshi and Nisargadatta's teachings, which you will be uh, very familiar with. After 20 years or so, I felt that I had come really to, to a, a kind of limit. Uh, I hit a wall. I, I, I deeply intuited that everything I was reading and hearing from the non-dual tradition was true. Uh, this was more than just a belief that it was true. There was a deep intuition that it was true, but I could not make it my own truth. I couldn't realize it for myself. So I began to move away from uh, Collet House. And at that time, I was going to spend some time in Ghana, in uh, Accra, and help uh, somebody set up a, a pottery there. And I went to Watkins Bookshop. You may be familiar, the, the famous esoteric bookshop in London. Just before my trip to, to Ghana, I wanted something to read. And I picked up a magazine off the, uh, off the magazine rack. It was called Self-Inquiry, uh, produced by the Raman Mahashi Foundation, which I had never heard of. Anyway, I put the, put the magazine in my bag, went off to, to uh, Ghana, staying in this little hotel on the outskirts of Accra. And um, one evening I opened this magazine and I came across an article called Return the Eye to the source by a man called Robert Adams, who I hadn't heard of. Now, I read the article and I, I, I remember weeping when I finished reading the article. It was as if, this is the way I, I formulated it to myself at the time, it was as if God had answered my prayer, my prayer, my unspoken prayer being, how do I make this non-dual understanding my own? And this, this article was written not just as a general response to my question. It was like tailor-made for me. So I thought, okay, as soon as I get back from Accra, I'm going to go and see this man, Robert Adams. Fast forward six months. I arrive in Sedona to meet Robert Adams, uh, rent a little apartment um, in the local town, 
and the next day Robert Adams dies. So I spend uh, that evening with a small group of his students in his room with his body dead on, on, on the bed covered in flowers and all his students singing songs. And so I'm very puzzled by this and, and not to mention profoundly disappointed because I felt that that this man was going to, this article had had such a profound effect on me. I was, uh, to say that I was looking forward to meeting him was um, would be an understatement. Anyway, on the last day of my trip, there somebody gave me a leaflet and said, here, read this on your way home. Put it in my bag, didn't think anything of it. Fast forward a couple of months. I then made contact with the Ramana Maharshi Foundation, Jane and Alan, who wrote the, um, who write the, uh, used to write the, ma- the magazine. I invited them down for a weekend to where I now lived in, had my studio in Shropshire. And they said, oh, we've, we want to give a, um, we want to hold a retreat somewhere in England for a man named Francis Roussel. And I thought, oh, that's, that's funny. Isn't he, wasn't he the guy on the, on, on the leaflet that that person gave me on the last day in Sedona? So I went, had a look at the, um, the article, l- looked it up. And sure enough, it was a, it was a, 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 a short dialogue from Francis Lucille. And I had, I had liked it very much. I remember it was a, 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 a response of his in answer to the question, what can we expect from, our meet, from these meetings? And so quite spontaneously, I said to Jane and, and Alan, oh, well, why don't you ask him to come and do the retreat here? We've got plenty of space. We'll clear out my studios and the gallery space in the barns and we, we can put people up. Fast forward four or five more months, Francis turns up at my home. I've never, we've never met each other. Uh, I sit, we, we sit down. The first words he say are meditation is a universal yes saying to everything. And at that moment, I feel this shiver running up my spine. And I realize this was why I went to Sedona. I finally met the, the, the teacher that will enable me to make this non-dual understanding my own. So after that meeting, I had a conversation with Francis, told him this story. And I said, what do I do now? And he said, just come as often as you can and as often as you want. He happens, happened to live in uh, Southern California then. So in spite of the fact that I had a young child and I was leading a pretty full active life as an artist, I went several times a year for, to, to week-long retreats with him and spent as much time as I possibly could over the next 13 or so years with him, initially asking a lot of questions, but the questions in time died down. And... Uh, Over this period of time, I can't say exactly how and I can't say exactly when, everything that I had read about and heard in the classical Advaita tradition and everything that I had so deeply intuited was true began to become my own lived and felt experience. One last uh, part of this story, Simon, because I can see you're you're getting twitching. <laughs> twitching. You're, twitching. <laughs> you're uh, going to have to start, uh, stop commenting on it, gentlemen, soon. Uh, anyway. okay. All right. <laughs> Fast forward again. There's a, so now this is um, after 13 or so years with Francis. I'm on a train uh, to uh, the opening of one of my exhibitions in Edinburgh. And I start just spontaneously writing just for the joy of it on my laptop on the train on, on, on the way up. Uh, this uh, this essay develops into a series of essays, which uh, Non Duality Press uh, then publishes. My first book, The Transparency of Things, um, as a result of which I began to receive invitations to to speak around the world in America and Europe, and then gradually over the last over the next few years, these invitations began to increase so much so that at some stage I had no longer had time for both activities, my my work as an artist in my studio and this new life writing and speaking about non-dual matters. And I never really made a conscious decision, but gradually my life just went more and more in the in the way of writing and speaking about these matters, which is how I find myself today. <laughs> 